All right, you're just going to walk with Officer Hines. Ruby Frankie, the former YouTuber turned convicted felon, now serving prison time for abusing her children in the name of religion. Frankie documented it all in a journal, and we have the disturbing details in her own words. Thanks for joining me for Crime Fix. I'm Anjanette Levy. If you thought that the abuse that Ruby Frankie's children suffered was bad, I can assure you it's much, much worse than anything that you imagined. Frankie documented the abuse and justified it by claiming her children have Satan within them and that demons have visited them. The journal starts in May of 2023 with a note stating that Jody Hildebrandt received a blessing from a temple president. What that blessing was and what it pertains to is somewhat unclear. In late June, Frankie wrote that her son refused to do wall sits. He says he is done. The following day, Frankie wrote that the boy is to stay outside, sleep outside, only to come in to use the bathroom and shower. After that, several pages are black. They're redacted. So there are pages and pages of information that we're not seeing. The journal picks up in July as Ruby Frankie's journal details the horror that her 12-year-old son and 10-year-old daughter endured over the next three months. I won't be using their names as they are the victims of horrific abuse. Frankie wrote about her son. Turns 12 tomorrow. I never envisioned him still being 12 and pooping and peeing himself. Satanic choices leads one to become destitute, even in the most affluential homes. Then the next day on her son's birthday, Frankie wrote about her daughter and son being in so much deviant behavior, they won't control their bodily functions. They're both furious. Their selfish, sinful lifestyle is being intervened upon. I told R he emulates a snake. He slithers and sneaks around looking for opportunities when no one is watching, and then he scurries. If he wants to emulate the Savior, then he needs to be 100% obedient. Ruby Frankie then said that her son lies all the time. He's a compulsive liar. This entire experience is a shock to my system. She wrote that her son has a cold, dead heart, and he's always been able to get what he wants. On July 14th, Frankie wrote that her daughter, quote, refuses to work, screams, has her hair shaved off. Frankie repeatedly shaved her daughter's hair when she didn't comply with her demands throughout the summer. The girl was only 10. Can you imagine? You shave off your daughter's hair because she refused to work. And we don't know exactly what kind of work she was refusing to do, but we can only imagine given what we have learned about the abuse. This was just the beginning of the summer of hell for these kids. Frankie said she told her son that he needed to divulge everything, that he needed to pray and to fast. He's workable and calm for a bit, and then angry and defiant the next. The only consistent thing about R is that he lies. That's what Frankie wrote about her son. She followed up by writing that her son told her he would rather have a glass of water than have her as a mom. Ruby Frankie then described July 11th of last year as a big day for evil. She sent her son to stand in the sun with a sun hat, but the boy's demons, she said, wanted to stand in the shade. So Frankie said she got a cactus poker to push the boy into the sun. Later, she poured mop water on him to cool him off. The children were forced to fast, but really it sounded more like they were being starved. They were continually told that they were lying and that they needed to repent for exactly what? No one really knows. If you can engage a weak-minded soul in a physical activity of obedience, you can begin to break the bond of Satan made with the weak. Ruby Frankie wrote that Jody Hildebrandt volunteered to help her with that. They planned to buy a ranch in Arizona where the children could do more hard work to rid themselves of Satan. At one point, Frankie wrote, The kids need a good kick from a horse and a cactus to run into. There were times when Frankie and Hildebrandt placed Frankie's daughter in a closet and refused to give her water if she screamed. Quote, she screamed for another family, water, food care, love, a manipulative ploy. You are loved. That's what Ruby Frankie wrote about her 10-year-old daughter. The girl was also made to jump into a cactus. Frankie said her daughter was actually cuddling with it, calling it inhuman. In late July, Frankie wrote about her daughter. We put her in the closet to contemplate what to do. She screams much of the day. She doesn't get water if she screams. She refuses to eat. The next day, she wrote, Jody wakes from a dream. 
God lets her know that we have done everything we can to get her attention. They also force the children to pull weeds from a cemetery for hours at a time and to pick up glass. Frankie's 12-year-old son was forced to jump on a mini trampoline for long periods of time and to balance on one foot. On August 27th, toward the end of the children's torturous captivity, Ruby Frankie wrote about her son. Spent the 22nd through the 25th peeing and pooping. He is out of control. He is defiant, abusive, mean, willing to try anything that would grab his attention. I whipped him with a belt yesterday. E2. Frankie then said her daughter peed all over Jody's garage floor, screamed at her and lied to her. She is out of control. How did you get the ropes on you? Three days later, on August 30th, the children had reached their breaking point. The 12-year-old boy escaped from Hildebrandt's house and went to a neighbor for help. With me to discuss the horrific, horrific information in Ruby Frankie's journal is somebody who's an expert in psychology and psychiatry. He is Dr. Daniel Bober. He's a forensic psychiatrist. Uh, Dr. Bober, you read through this just as I did. Your first thoughts on what you've read. Absolutely horrific. Um, heavily redacted, but the details that are in there are very disturbing. Why, why do you think it was so heavily redacted? I mean, we have pages and pages of black. Uh, I mean, we have black boxes, of course, but then we have pages full of black. Why would the law enforcement officials in the courts redact that information? Maybe too personal, too disturbing, as if the rest isn't disturbing. It's, it's just, um, yeah, maybe there were things in there that were, they just felt were too intimate to share. It's very hard to know. I'm trying to imagine a world, uh, you know, I'm a mom. I'm trying to imagine a world in which I look at my children ages 12 and nine or 10, somewhere in that range. And I think to myself, you, Satan is within you. And in order to drive Satan out of you, my, my friend Jody here, she's going to volunteer to take you to, you children, you young kids, to her house. And you're going to be starved. Uh, you're going to be forced to do physical labor, collecting weeds and glass and what have you from a cemetery for hours at a time. Um, being poked with a cactus, held underwater, forced to stand out in the sun, because that is going to drive Satan out of you. What, where is that coming from in Ruby Frankie's mind? Well, you know, ironically, it actually happens to be the parents who are often the perpetrators uh, with these victims of abuse. One in seven children in the last year were abused, about 600,000 last year. And we know that the parents are most likely going to be the perpetrators. But in this particular case, clearly there was something that was not right with this woman, whether she had her own abuse or her own mental illness. I've never obviously examined her, so I cannot say. But there are certainly people that have what we call an authoritarian form of discipline that's based on coercion, control, sort of breaking the will of the child. But this takes it to a new level. So clearly, there is some form of mental illness going on with this woman. We obviously don't know what it is. We don't know her background, her trauma, maybe her own maltreatment. But clearly, this is not just a, a normal form of parenting. This is going on with, uh, or was going on, I should say, with the 12-year-old and the 10-year-old. I'm not going to use their names. They are, they are victims of abuse. Um, there were other children. Um, in the, but it was these, these two children were singled out. We know there are older children and then children younger. Um, can you think in your mind as to why these two children were singled out for, for this abuse? I mean, Ruby Frankie is, is telling herself in these writings that she's, and I don't quite understand it, like why she thinks her children are so possessed. I, I have some, my own theories, but because of the redactions, I, I can't really get too deep into that, but she thinks they're, they, they're being influenced by the devil. but why these two young kids, 12 and 10, why are they being singled out for this horrific abuse and maybe not the other kids? Well, the younger kids are the easiest targets. They're the most vulnerable. They're the ones that have the hardest time fighting back. But I think what this story tells us is something much larger in society, which is this whole concept of what I like to call the Facebook fallacy or the Instagram illusion is that people watch this mother. She became 
an overnight sensation. At one point, she had over 2 million followers. But it just goes to show you that everything you see, everything you hear, you have to question. You have to be skeptical. You have to be cynical because all these people that are posting this stuff on social media, we develop this opinion of them. But we, we know that with people, you only get two things, what they show you and what you want to see. So this is a, a, a perfect example of how an image can be manipulated in society to make people believe that people are a certain way when nothing could be further from the truth. And I, I don't, she did have a lot of followers, but I don't think anybody ever thought Ruby Frankie was perfect because she, I mean, people were raising concerns about this for a long time, saying this woman, the way she's treating her kids on YouTube and on TikTok or what have you is not right. But, but that pales into comparison um, and what is written in these documents and what Ruby Frankie documented. Uh, why on earth would somebody, in your opinion, um, document all of this abuse? It almost makes me think like she thought she was doing the right thing, but I, I, I don't understand how someone in the name of God could think that they were doing the right thing by having their children do things like carry heavy boxes upstairs and stand out in the sun and, um, you know, as punishment, run up hills and, you know, stay in a closet without food and call it fasting. I, I, I just don't get it. Yeah, well, maybe it was something that she was taking to a delusional extreme, which is why she made no attempt to conceal it and, in fact, document it. Uh, I think it's very important what you're saying. You know, she didn't really try to hide it, uh, and people had expressed concerns for a long time. Uh, we're not just talking about the people that were watching her YouTube, but the people that lived close by were telling police for years that there's something going on. So. I wonder what the role of law enforcement is in all of this, because it feels like they kind of dropped the ball. They didn't respond to all these pleas for help. And this is not a, you know, the, the only time that we know of that law enforcement kind of didn't really follow through on something. You know, they obviously have a tough job uh, and they're overworked and they're underpaid and they're outgunned. But in this particular case, if calls were made to 911 and there was no follow through, I think this went on a lot longer than it needed to much longer. I mean, if this begins in May of 2023, the kids escape the house in late August. This journal ends on August 27th. I mean, she details the whole summer. The whole summer is in this 60 pages of documents. And she talks about, you know, these kids, uh, you know, being ungrateful. They're, I mean, she, it, they're kids. I mean, they're like 12 year old and 10 year old kids. They're, they're probably just doing things that children do. Um, right. And well, they're I'm, being I'm also, a, I'm also a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I can tell you that I have this conversation with parents all the time. They say, well, how do I discipline my child? It's the difference between taking away something they want and something that they need. You know, if you're not letting them play with their toys, that's one thing. But if you're depriving them of a meal of nutrition, that is abuse. Yeah, I've never heard of fasting for a child. Maybe if you're getting blood work done, but I mean, giving the child, you know, just like lentils and yeah, there's really no legitimate medical like reason for that, right? Yeah, it's disgusting. Uh, you know, there were some other things in here too. She's talking about this 12 year old, how he's continuing to, um, you know, he's defecating himself and wetting himself. Um, there are some kids I know that take a really long time to to be able, to, you know, like there's something going on with the brain. It, it's not communicating with the bladder. Um, you know, she's talking about him wetting himself and defecating himself a lot. There are some kids who just, especially boys, overnight, they just won't wake up to go to the bathroom and stuff like that. I don't know if that was part of this, but she's talking about how disgusting he is because he's defecating, he's pooping himself and peeing himself. I mean, it could be a reaction to the abuse he's enduring. Absolutely. Absolutely. I could not have said it better myself. We know that kids very often are nonverbal and they can't talk about their feelings. So they will express their feelings as sometimes a change in bowel or bladder habits. That can be a sign of trauma. That can be a sign of abuse. So you're right on target. The world can be a really scary place and people who might look like they're nice people living right next door to you, kind of like people in the Ruby Frankie story, can actually turn out to be monsters. And you have to do everything you can do to keep yourself and your family safe. The website truthfinder.com is something that you can use 
to do just that. It's a website that allows you to search public records for any red flags, and it will help you get information about the people you encounter in your lives every day. Log into TruthFinder and search for a name. You'll get a person's address, past and current, any possible criminal records, results, and even traffic tickets. Maybe you want to search a neighbor, possibly a new friend, or someone who's going to babysit your kids. Maybe it's just someone you met at the gym or maybe out at a coffee shop who you struck up a conversation with. TruthFinder will even show you sex offender statuses for people living in your neighborhood. The cases we cover here make it very clear. You cannot take too many steps to keep yourself and your kids safe. So if you'd like to check out TruthFinder, and I think you should, you can get 50% off of confidential background reports. Just log on to www.truthfinder.com slash lccrimefix and start accessing information about almost anyone. There's also a humiliation aspect of this that I find so disturbing. Um, the little girl, you know, they're saying, basically, we're going to shave your head. Ruby keeps telling her, I'm going to shave your head. If you make any faces at me, I will shave your ha hair off. And she did that several times throughout these documents. And that to me, it's like, you're a, you're a girl. And a lot of girls, not all, but a lot of girls have longer hair. And That's part of their identity. It's what, yeah, it's what makes us um, a girl. who we are. Right. Makes right. me a girl, right? Makes right. me a girl. When I was a kid, I always had long hair. I've got longer hair now as an adult. Right. Um, and that to me was like, she was just trying to shame her and humiliate her along with the physical abuse. Absolutely. Another form of physical and emotional abuse, shaming them, depriving them of something that's part of their identity, humiliation, all part of the abuse. Um, and I know I'm asking you to speculate here. What kind of mental illness could Ruby Frankie suffer from? So it could be some form, some form of severe trauma, possibly dissociation. It could be psychosis that she's literally out of touch with reality. Um, maybe even drug or alcohol use. We just don't know. It would be pure speculation to say. Um, and if the fact that she didn't try to conceal it and she documented it and she basically handed the prosecution their case, you know, makes me think that maybe she wasn't completely in touch with reality, but I wouldn't know unless I spoke with her and I looked at her own um, documents and records. There was another disturbing aspect of this. <laughs> I mean, the disturbing aspects go on and on. I don't know what, it's. it just gets worse and worse, but they were going to buy property, Jody and Ruby, according to this diary, and they were going to buy property in Arizona and move the kids out there so they could continue because it, whatever they were doing in Utah was not suitable enough. So it needed to be much harder. The work had to be harder. That's the only way you become obedient and compliant and that you resist Satan. So they're going to move them out to a ranch in Arizona. My God, I, I, I fear for what could have happened to these kids had the boy not escaped and gone for help. They could have died. Yeah. Well, they would have been even more cut off from anyone that could have helped them, more isolated uh, as horrific as it is, it could have even been more horrific. What is it going to take for these children to get through this? I mean, intensive therapy, obviously, but what, what will it take? Will they, will they ever be able to recover from this and, and get stronger from enduring this? I mean, I, I know it's hard for you to say that having not met them, but I, I just can't even imagine these poor kids, what, they, what they've gone through and what they will continue to go through. We know that victims of abuse have much higher rates of depression, of anxiety, of insomnia, of, or, of all sorts of mental illness, post-traumatic stress that they will probably have to deal with for years. It probably will take years of therapy, years of treatment for them to develop any kind of trusting relationship with another human being. Well, let's hope that they're able to somehow get to a point where they can flourish and and recover to some degree it's going to be a process and take a long time most uh, important thing Frankie, is that they're away from these that they're away from these people is the most important first step most definitely and they are where they belong in prison dr daniel bober thank you so much for joining me my pleasure thank you and that's it for this edition of crime fix i'm anjanette levy thanks so much for being with us we'll see you back here next time